Hi, my name is Debbie McGrath, and I'm the head of programs for Anti Slavery International. I'm going to talk to you today about our work in South Asia. Uh, it should be our South Asia manager who stood here in front of you today, um, but rather inconveniently, she decided to go and get married this weekend, so we've let her take the day off. So, in South Asia, currently we focus on two key issues. First is forced and bonded labor. This is the form of slavery which affects the highest numbers in South Asia. So in India, for example, where there's an estimated 18 million people affected by modern slavery, by far the most common form of slavery is forced and bonded labor. Our strategy is to take a sectorial approach. So we work within particular industries. So for example, the brick kiln industry, domestic work industry, construction industry, and we develop models or pilots which can be scaled up, very similar to how uh, Sarah described for the Africa program. And again, we also focus in South Asia on building the capacity of local civil society organizations and facilitating the building of workers associations and movements, enabling people to come together and to claim their rights themselves. This enables us to have some hope of being able to tackle slavery sustainably. Key factors in South Asia which perpetuate slavery, some of which Aidan mentioned this morning, is discrimination against low caste and religious minorities, gender discrimination, a lack of employment and livelihoods within certain states and countries, which means that people have to migrate to look for work, and poor implementation of laws and policies. So how do people become bonded? Typically, workers are recruited by agents who offer them jobs, and then they are trapped because they accept an advance on the earnings to be able to get to the job, and that turns out to be a loan, often at exorbitant rates, which they can never hope to repay. Soon their entire family is involved in trying to increase the work output, so the entire family becomes bonded. And unpaid debts are often bequeathed from one generation to the next. Our current project in India focuses on the brick kilns. We work in both the source states where the migrants come from and in the destination states where the brick kilns are in order to address the issue hostilically. An estimated 10 million people work in the brick kilns in India. So it's not our aim to stop people from working in the brick kilns. It's a critical means of employment. What we want to do is to end bondage, to end abuse, and to make sure that the employment is regulated. To do this, our approach is threefold. Firstly, we try and reduce vulnerability by making sure that workers are aware of what their rights are. We facilitate them, as I said, to come together in workers' movements and collectives, empowering them to be able to fight for their rights. And we enable them to assist social security and other benefits, which they're entitled to but often don't know about thereby reducing their vulnerability, their need to take loans in the first place, so reducing their vulnerability to becoming bonded. For example, in India, in the Punjab, we have raised the awareness of over 37,000 brick kiln workers just in the last year alone. And in the source states, in Chattisgarh, where we work, we've raised the awareness of over 25,000 people who were thinking of migrating for work. So that's over 60,000 workers just in the one year. We raise their awareness on things like uh, minimum wages, uh, right to education for their children, uh, access to contracts, being able to keep their IDs, um, what to do when they, when they have problems, so that people are much more empowered by the time they turn up at the brick kilns. At the same time, we try to improve the conditions for people once they arrive at the brick kilns. So we work with the employers, the brick kiln owners, trying, for example, to increase um, the provision of water and sanitation within the brick kilns. And we push for the loan system to be regulated. We underpin this with legal support, um, helping workers once they are abused, and in the last year alone have helped 800 people to be released from debt bondage in India. 
And we also do advocacy at the local, national, and international level to push for laws to be enforced. There are laws uh, banning bondage, but they're just not enforced. So we do advocacy to make sure that bonded labor can be eradicated in the long term. Next month, we're due to start a new, new US-funded program where we will not only expand our, expand our work to other states in India, but also expand into the agricultural sector. The other issue that we focus on at the moment is unsafe migration and human trafficking. So for example, to the Gulf, which is highly dependent on migrant labor. Countries like Kuwait and Oman, more than 50% of the population are actually made up of migrant workers. To the extreme of places like Qatar, where 90% of the workforce is actually migrant labor. This acute need for labor gives rise to inc acute in increased possibilities for human trafficking. And South Asia provides the bulk of the workforce in the Gulf states. In addition, within South Asia itself, workers migrate from one country to another, with many Nepalese and Bangladesh workers, for example, vulnerable to exploitation within other countries within South Asia, such as India. For example, this year, we piloted a program in India providing safe migration training to workers who were thinking of migrating to the Gulf in the construction sector. We provided training for over 300 would-be migrants and provided them with a work passport that they could carry with them, giving them information and key contacts that they could use once they got there. And we also trained other organizations in India to increase the number of the organizations who can actually address this issue sustainably. At the same time, we continue our work uh, to try and tackle of the abuse when domestic workers migrate for work. Women and girls are particularly vulnerable to trafficking and forced labor when they migrate in the domestic sector, domestic work sector and in the garment industry. As in the brick kiln sector, our approach is to address the informality of the sector. We try and increase their access to entitlements and social security to make them more aware of their rights, to help them come together and form, form workers' associations. In India, for example, we have just completed the first two-year phase of a project, supporting migrant domestic workers as they mi migrate across the southern states. The impact of that project is clear. Domestic workers in the project areas have become much more aware of their rights and have gained, gained confidence in bargaining with their employers. So for example, this year, we've seen wage increases secured for 1,100 of those workers and 308 of them signed formal employment contracts with their employers. Plus, we continue our work to support uh, migrant domestic workers as they migrate from countries like Nepal and Bangladesh to the Lebanon, providing them with safe migration information before they leave and with support once they arrive in the Lebanon. Currently, we're looking to expand our migration program uh, to work not only from India, but also with, within other countries to in, from India and in other sectors. In addition to increasing our work in both the bonded labor and the um, migration program, we've also been looking at expanding our South Asia program in other areas. So for example, recently we've been doing some scoping in the garment sector where Anti-Slavery International used to do some work. We've identified uh, gaps in the source states area and we're looking to develop projects in that area. We've also done some scoping with partners to look at expanding our work on child marriage and sexual exploitation in India. We've also been looking at uh, developing projects in Pakistan and uh, we have an assessment visit coming up in January. And likewise in Nepal, where we used to have a project focusing on the agricultural sector in bonded labor, we're trying to develop a new project to uh, build on the success of that. So that's a very brief whirlwind tour of our work in South Asia and our plans going forward. I'm not sure, Elizabeth, if we've got time for questions, have we? Okay, uh, so if anybody's got questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Did you say 18 million or 80? 
Uh, in India, it's an estimated 18 million people affected by modern slavery. Yeah, 18. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. <laughs>